Hello, Narada. Here we are. We, we, we. I, I've uh, actually finally met my hero here. Here he is, Narada, and uh, I'm so excited to see him. I've, I, I forgot to hit record, and he's telling me about it. hearing Billy Cobham for the first time, and we, we know it's is a, a major moment. So, but we're here, aren't we, Narada? We're here. We, we, yeah. yeah. So tell me. So you're in this shop, and you hear Billy for the first time. Yeah, I'll back up. I was saying, Andy, that first of all, I just want to tell you, I'm like you are. I'm a real fan. I'm a real fan. And when I was uh, in Pasadena, California, living with my cousin, Art Hackley, um, I was able to go there and just practice drums. But one day I was in Pasadena in a record shop and on came the Inner Mind Flame album. And I was saying to you that Billy Cobham's work was so incredible because yeah, chops, yeah, all that. But he was dirt funky, man. His hi-hat work on that jam, Vital Transformation, is incredible. How how mean and street and the hip new generation coming into the jazz. That's what, what caught me. Vishnu's great guitar work, all that, yes. But the drumming, and then when I found out it was Cobham, I remember I had heard Cobham a little bit, was the band called Dreams. Dreams with Will Lee and all them cats. And then I realized again how clean he is, how beautiful. You know, most, a lot of drummers are great, but they may not be as clean. Cobham was so clean and so precise and nasty at the same time. It was phenomenal. Yeah. Heavy, that's, how I, that's how I got hooked. Heavy funk. I, yeah. I, I started, I literally started drumming when I was 12 years old and, I, and um, I picked up the sticks. I didn't have a drum kit. I've been playing for about a week and my mom goes, there's a drummer on the TV tonight. He's doing a master class on the TV, a master class. It was never, the, this is never on the TV normally. And I, at 12 years old, I switched it on. It was Billy Cobham and I didn't know who he was. So I watched this TV program and then I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm searching for this drummer. Who is he? You know, I didn't know who he was. And then, then I get uh, wired and I hear you and you just floored me on that album that was it that's what i was looking for and so you and billy were they you were the two drummers you know the, the two most important drummers you know in my life you know in terms of and it, it it's like you say it's it's more than the technique it's the spirit some some drummers can make you feel bad when you hear them play because they they intimidating or you think i can never play like that but when i listen to you it made it made me want to be me he wanted he maybe want to play like me same thing with billy there was a spirit and a, a a vibe there that was beyond the notes like you say it was there the two things the precision and yet the the dirt and the funk at the same time you know um so so how did you how old were you when you started drumming when i started yeah i want to i say man I, I was always playing music in my heart I feel like God gave me a gift of music. I asked God for a gift of music and God said, I'll give you a gift of music, but you have to remain grateful. Inspire gratitude in, in the world. I said, okay. So I feel like I've always had some longing for music, be it staring at an album jacket, you know, when I was a little kid of the honky tonk with a beautiful girl on a cover from Bill Doggett or, or George Sharon with Peggy Lee, uh, or just watching the record 45 spin. And then my dad would bring home uh, an album of Max Roach and Billy and Buddy Rich going at it. That was intriguing. Or even ch ch childish music like Froggy Went a Court and a Heated Lie. It could be anything. But then I got caught wind of Ray Charles' live in person album. And that just broke my heart open because here, this is the beginning of like a cat who does everything. Jazz, blues, the rock Bible, I, uh, what I say. Uh, and when you listen to Ray Charles and you hear that voice, yeah, the voice that goes right back. Yeah. The, yeah the, the thing, this music goes right back. You know, we yeah. we were talking the other day about Louis Armstrong. If I if I listen to Louis, yeah. This album. This album. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, <laughs> it's it, it these these guys, they they there's a there's a thing. I don't know where it's going to. I don't think any of us know where it's going. It goes right back and we don't know where it goes to. You know, I, I, this is the thing I find absolutely fascinating with music. Yeah, I hear it with Ray Charles loads. It's in his voice. Yes. The grooves in his voice. Yes. Same thing with Louis, the grooves in his voice. Uh, yes. And, and uh, um, I, I had the same thing. My dad brought me up with lots and lots of 
different jazz. I listened to Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Chico Hamilton. My dad was a big Chico Hamilton fan, you know. Okay. So and that, and that it's the same thing. You recognise something and you go searching for it. Well, who were the drummers you were listening to before you heard Cobham and? Uh, everybody, I, any, any, anything and everything. See in Michigan, I, okay, I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan. It's between Detroit and Chicago. So uh, you hear everything and you listen to everything and you appreciate everything. Could be Everly Brothers, Wake Up Little Susie. You know what I mean? Just really straight up pop music. Uh, Curtis Maple coming out of Chicago with the impressions, all that music. And then of course Motown got hot with Smokey Robinson and Miracles shop around all that music. And then when Stevie Wonder hit on the scene, I, my, my, my twin aunt said, there's a, there's a cat who's better than you on the drums. I said, oh, who? I said, he's, he's blind. I said, he's blind? How can he play drums if he's blind? He says, we don't know, but he does. His name is Stevie Wonder, little Stevie Wonder. And I was like, really, you know? And then I heard the, the song Fingertips, part one and part two. And that blew, blew, my, blew my mind. Fingertips was so high and so badass. That I was like, God, and I, I wanted to go see him. So I did in Chicago. I went to the Regal Theater in Chicago to see little Stevie Wonder. And man, the way he walked on the stage was like an alien, you know? They walk him out, they walk him out. And the, and the girls are screaming like Beatles, just like, just roaring because he was a star. And that band kicked in. You know, he's just doing this thing on a harmonica and singing the carol. And it was just flooring that he had so much command at 12, 13 years old, what he, what he was. So that was mind blowing to me. And then later on, my drum teacher played drums for him and came back to Kalamazoo, Michigan. I saw them play together. That group was just powerful, you know? So I've just been surrounded by just rhythm and, and joy and, and triumph of, of, of victory. Steve would stand on this drum stool and make people go crazy and fall off the stool, get back and play again, stand up, fall down again, play, fall down again. I mean, it was just craziness, but it was so exciting. I fell in love with the excitement of music and the love of it. Yeah. That's, that's just incredible. It, yeah. I mean, you're, you're coming up at a time when there's so much happening, isn't there? There's so much. And then you've got like Jimi Hendrix, haven't you? You've got Mitch Mitchell, you've got all that going on, Led Zeppelin, all these. This is all happening at the same time. It's an incredible time to be coming up with. Incredible time. And before that, I want to say one more, one more cat who I really love when I was a little kid uh, on an album by Horace Silver and, uh, and um, the album's called Six Pieces of Silver. He's 18 years old out of Detroit, Michigan, named Lewis Hayes on the Senior Blues and that whole album. And, and they, my aunts again brought, brought it to me and said, this guy's young, 18 years old out of Detroit. So to hearing him playing with the mouths and the sticks and how much control he had, how beautiful he was, so melodic, was very, very beautiful for me. Because I would sit on the on a pie, I would sit on a high chair with a with a with a box and a pie tin, like a cymbal, and play along. That's how I first got playing. And also now my Nina Simone, live at Town Hall. I mm. play along with that. Beautiful. It's yeah. all the best, it's all the best music. How can you go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> now you mentioned Mitch Mitchell, a big influence on me with Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix was the man from Purple Haze on right on through, strong. And Mitch was able to just bring so much fire to, to what Jimmy was doing. And Funk too, but chops galore and, and fire. And we just love Mitch Mitchell, love Mitch Mitchell. This, this is something with, that I don't think gets mentioned enough about John McGoughlin because John, that scene he was in in London in the sixties and the, and the people he was playing with, they were basically creating rock music, you know, not just a Jimi Hendrix, but but Cream and Clapton and um, Jimmy Page, all those guys, and 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 John was with those guys, basically creating rock music. Yes. I mean, you talk about a fusion musician; he was fusing music in the early '60s, yes. and I think when he went to um, the US and met Miles, that was the X factor because Miles was able to bring this virtuoso jazz musician in but also a guy that understood that British rock thing that was going on in London. And I, I've, I've got friends, like I was saying before, I forgot to hit record, you know, I've got friends who are in that scene and there was so much happening, you know, a, a Ginger Baker and Mitch Mitchell and, and all that sort of thing, you know, and then in America, you've got, you've got drummers like Elvin Jones and Tony Williams. And I, 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 I 
I sort of got to Tony through you because I could hear a lot of Tony Williams in your playing. Is that correct? Was that was he an influence? Yes, very much so. I love Tony Williams. I love all those cats. But you mentioned Tony because Tony was like fiery. So I love the fire of Tony Williams. But again, I was never going to be Tony Williams. No one's never going to be Tony Williams. But we're but we're inspired by the genius of Tony Williams. That's what that's what it is. We're inspired by these people, you know. But I knew I would never be never be Tony Williams. And, and obviously, but, I, but I did try to go to his teacher. I I tried to go to Berkeley School of Music at one point, and study with a cat named Alan Dawson. And when I when I went there, on the on his wall, where all these students had already filled in, and there was no room. And I didn't really want to be in Boston, suffering, struggling. And then the guy I wanted to study with, because he taught Tony, was already filled up. So I told my friend Bob Knapp, "Get me out of here." And then I came back to California. It's one of the things I've always interest, been interesting with you is that when when you joined the Mavishn Orchestra, how old were you, Nada? You you must have been twenty something. Yes, I was twenty, just twenty twenty one. Uh -huh. Well, you see, for me, I heard the 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 first time I ever heard anything like that was Crosswinds by Billy Cobham, and there was a track on there in seventeen sixteen, and that took me about two years to get what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then it took me another two years to be able to play. I mean, I spent a whole life trying to get my head around that. And then I heard the Mavish. So you you must have heard Mavish Nocturne 1971. And then when you joined the Mavish, you're ready. How did you do that? How did you jump into that band in that amount of time? Because that didn't exist before. How did you do that? that was, I was very, very lucky. I was very lucky to always be playing my, my drums. And... I was with a band just prior to that, two bands, one called the, the New Maguire Sisters with Sandy Tirano and Ralph Armstrong on bass and Billy McCoy on piano. And we were able to stretch out and, and really and, um, play in different odd meters. We were, some of the musicians at that time were inspired by Mavish Orchestra. So we were able to take and just, just push ourselves to the limit, push ourselves and play all the time. And that helped tremendously. And then uh, as I, when I became a disciple, after I met John McLaughlin, I became a disciple. And then I lived uh, in Connecticut with a band called Jatra. That was a, a guitar player, Omar Mesa from Mandrill. And I had a band with them. And they also enjoyed doing some odd meter work and pop work or whatever. And then on the keyboards of Gail Moran. So I'm becoming friends with all these great people along the way. But that all these things kind of led up to um, being at, working with my with Mavish. And one more thing I want to say about that, and even in LA, before I left LA, there was a guitar player named Eddie Hazel, who came from a band called Part One Funkadelic. Yeah. Magnum yeah. I played with him. And he played the fast funk. Like Vishnu, fast. Fast. So it'd be spinning around the room how fast it go. So I had different experiences playing with people that prepared me as best possible. And what, were the charts or how, I mean, how does- Never, never, no, 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 charts don't exist at that level. They don't, man. No. I, I couldn't read to, there's a guy right now named Aubrey up in Canada who transcribes what I play, or play, play with me or those the stuff like that, or Mavishnu, and I can't read that stuff. Uh, it was, to me at that, you, we're praying for God to come through. So when God comes through, I, I, don't, I have no idea. I'm just doing what I feel, I, you know, is the spirit. I, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to, I would only play in, say, 19 for the whole week. <laughs> okay. But, uh, that, it, it was like, it was like a meditation, everything, you know. So now those time signatures are, are, are in me, you know, uh, they're quite, they're, this is a deep thing. And it, 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 it's a, it, it's a focus thing. It, it sort of focuses your mind when you play like that. But it took me a long, long time. I, I just have always thought, how did these guys just walk in and, you know, because uh, uh, John was just, he had just was, it, the, he's, he's just like a shooting star at that point, isn't he? It's like a shooting star. It's he taught me, he taught me. When he asked me to join the band, he said, I'll come back in um, January of 1974 in, in the basement where you practice with Jatra and I will teach you to play with me. And he did. He came in the basement and we were playing seven, nine, 11, 13, whatever it would be. And he wanted to play cat and mouse. And when I say cat and mouse, I mean the highest level of cat and mouse, where he would not want me to play downbeat. Don't play any ones. Just, just go with me. Just go with me and listen. 
and don't play too many too many downbeats. So I just learned how to just kind of just listen to him. And then when I see his body rocking, I see what he get into. It would be like um, phenomenal. But just to, to hear him, to hear how he plays is phenomenal. Yeah. And then also, I also found a freedom in a bass line. If a bass player was there, Ralph Armstrong or some bass line, where I could hook onto that and the odd meter. Because Vishnu would teach us, the odd meter could be like a shape. You know, he said, learn the shape, learn the shape of it. So the bass could also help me find the shape. Like you mentioned miles out, right? The way, the way I can get so far out there on miles out is because of that bass line. Yeah. Is it love it is, go dig it, get. I hear that in my head, in my headphone. Then I know it's there, I can depend upon that. I can go, I can go out to Venus. I can go out to Mars, I can go out anywhere I want because I know, but did it, did it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the band was really successful as well. So you're, you got to play incredible music to such audiences all over the world that it must have just been such an incredible time and and meeting all these musicians i i mean i i'm trying to sit here ask you questions and my brain's just sort of exploding because these are all my heroes you know but to meet these people and you know you you, you play with alan holdsworth who's my other hero you know all the, you, you you play jeff beck you play with tommy bowling it's just it's it, 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 absolutely incredible absolutely incredible um, what what were the um, these are, might be see, seems like silly questions, but I've had them in my head all my life, and you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty aware how Apocalypse was recorded because that was, a, was an incredible album for the first album to do with the London Symphony Orchestra and all that sort of thing. But with Visions of the Emerald Beyond, were you all in the room at the same time? Oh yes, that's Jimi Hendrix Studio. Yes, that's Electric Ladyland Studios. I'm in the same place where Mitch Mitchell sat. I'm in the same place where Buddy Miles sat. I'm in that in that little corner there where, they, where the, the drums go. And Ken Scott is so incredible because you know he would teach us, it mic the drums a certain kind of way to get those sounds you hear, or he would teach us to, uh, um, to put a, sh a sheet over the bass drum for bump, 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 how to get that beautiful sound like Ringo would get. Uh, I put a towel on a bait on a on a tom tom, just whatever it would be. He, Ken Scott was really incredible to work with at that time, yeah. Because I really wanted the drums to sing, and he knew all about that. And Mahavishnu was so also very beautiful to um, bring I'm, us along. I'm, try, I'm trying so hard not to ask drummy questions because I know I can go down that road. But your your toms on those albums. That's I've been in studios saying playing Visions of the Emerald Beyond <laughs> saying. Get the toms like this, you know, because they seem to just run into each other. It's an incredible, incredible sound, you know, absolutely incredible. Great. Wonderful, wonderful engineers, and those were wonderful drums. Those are Gretsch drums that were painted on the inside, double enamel. It's kind of a gray paint, double sprayed, and the guys who put it together at Frank's Drum Shop. I told them I was coming into the Mob Vision Orchestra, and Billy had was playing fives, those clear, loud, yeah, fives drums. So I said, I need a drum set and I want them to be, to be white, but make them loud. And they said, okay, we're gonna double spray, paint them on the inside, double coat them. And it, had, it was a trick. It made them really like, like what you hear on the record. Yeah. Just bang, 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 like that. And the snare drum, they made customized for me as well with a kind of what's called cat gut on the bottom. They were straight on the bottom, like five straight strands. I've never seen anything like it, but that became the snare drum. That's incredible. Yeah, I know. So they they get all the credit. I just told them, give me what do you think would be the best? And they did. Frank's Drum Shop, that's that's the mecca in, in, in New York. I mean, you see uh, 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 Joe Jones laying up against the wall talking stuff. You see any, any of your, your, your heroes coming in there. It was that kind of place. Yeah. You see, you were very yeah. humble there very humble and they they turned me out that's that that's that's incredible um when what happened like, this is another this, uh, maybe a silly question but you get the gig with the mavish noxture and then obviously all these different sessions start to come in so you played with weather reports you played with you know tommy ball you know all these things so 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 what was that like you know what was that like because incredible incredible, well. incredible 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 that time of my life 
uh that'd be like around 75 now yeah 74 was making apocalypse and touring but 75 it all exploded again with the vision there emerald beyond um tommy bone coming up not long after that and and uh weather report with um i did the weather report black market and then came on they said why don't you join the band and and uh bring a bass player and i said i'm not sure i can join the band because i've been asked to join tommy bone's band which i think i want to do do something a little different at this time in my life. And, but I said, I know Jaco Pastores out of Miami. We had played a lot in Miami together. And I said, and Joe said, I think I've heard of him. I said, why don't we fly him in and just see how that works out? And we did next day. Hmm. Jaco flew in and then his audition was Cannonball on the Black Market album, that second yeah. track. And I'm telling you, man, Joe starts teaching us a song. And Joe started learning the stuff. I mean, Jaco started learning it, but adding his riffs into it and then, Joe says, don't, don't play that shit on my song, which was daunting because Jocko could play every damn thing. And we was kind of mighty about it. So it really made him just focus on the music and being his best and just playing what it really needed as opposed to because he could. And he became Jocko Pastorius, bro. It was Joe Zawano that put him in the fire yeah, and, and made him which you now know as Jaco Pastorius. He was always genius, but working with Joe under Joe's tutelage got the best of Jaco. And then Jaco started flying, man, just flying. And Joe, Joe Zawinul could be really hard on drummers because he, he played drums, didn't he? Zawinul was a good drummer, wasn't he? Not that I ever knew, I can't lie. I never heard Joe play drums. Yeah. Not, not with me, he, I didn't, he didn't play drums. But I will tell you this, he would say, when it comes time for my, for my, uh, my solo, like a synth solo or piano solo, go on that ride cymbal. He'd be really strong, go on that ride cymbal. I said, okay. But on Black Market, that was like a live, that was live. And it felt like it felt like a funk, a live funk session. Cause like, you know, Wayne Shorter, in my mind, I think it's jazz, but he can play like Junior Walker style sax. He can play like, you know, like all that stuff. It's like, when we started going there, that's when it really went stellar. You know, it was just like a like a like a nightclub jam. It's my favorite Weather Report album. It's because you're on it. <laughs> it is though. It's my. I did a video the other day. It's my favorite Weather Report. There's something on that album, and it's you and Jacko. I mean, and Alfonso Johnson. He's an incredible. I feel like he doesn't get mentioned. He's his bass playing on Black Market with you. That is an incredible sound. Incredible. Yes, he is. And and truly, he is. He's my friend. He's my brother. I'm very happy to be on his solo album. I wrote a song called Until Yourself, Until I Thine Own Self Be True. I just love Alfonso because he's got that, that real soul about him and he's very kind. Mm -hmm. I find most of these people are really exceptionally kind people. They're exceptional human beings. I think that's why the music sounds so sweet because they have a, a purity about them, like, like a childlike innocent about them. Well, I, I've, I've been playing for not, not as long as you know, but I've been playing for 40 years. Yeah. And it took me a long time to realize that music is basically love. It's made out of love. That's what it is. Yeah, that's right. Well, you got it, Andy, man. Andy Edwards, you got it. It's it I've been a long time to realize this. You walk in the room with those players and you're there because you love them. It, it was it was something that uh, Elvin Jones says, you know, you know, they, someone said, what was it like to play with Coltrane? And you said, well, if you're going to play with John, you've got to be prepared to to die for the motherfucker, I think that's what he said. And and, and I and I thought that, what, what does he mean? What does he mean? But it's because he loved the guy. Yeah. And it is true, you you know, you and, and musicians like you, are, I've got a relationship with you, Cobham, John McGoughlin, these, and it's, what is it? It's, I love your playing, I love you, that's you and that's your spirit. I, I love Coltrane, I love Miles. This is what it's made out of. And then, so to walk in a room and play with someone, that's love that's going on. And that's what's in the music. That's what you hear when it's good. When the ego yeah. gets in the way, it, it's not so much there. I, that's, what I, that's what I've learned playing it as much as I have, you know. I completely agree. I love Jimi Hendrix. And when he died, I felt like, wow, what am I gonna do? Because I felt like I'd be lucky enough to maybe play with him. But then I found Mahavishnu. And that was the way for me because I needed a new way of living that wouldn't be drugs, wouldn't be drinking. It would be a, a God way, a, a meditation way, a prayer way of living so I could have a long life 
and be consistent, which I wanted to be. I didn't want to be like good one night, bad one night, good one night, bad. I wanted to find like a way I could just feel good all the time. And Vishnu and his teacher really gave me all the keys I needed. Like Guru Sri Sri Chimoy would say, don't compete with Billy Cobham, just compete with yourself, be the best for you. And I needed to hear that. I needed to just not think about Billy, not think about nothing else. Because I can never be like Billy Cobham or those people. They're, they're a whole other league. <laughs> but I can, I can go into my own heart. So that's what it is. Go in my own heart. And I love my vision, like Delvin, Delvin loved John Coltrane. And I just, I was his puppy dog. I wanted to just do everything he wanted, everything he needed. And it made me so happy when he would have a good concert, have a good time and just be happy. That's all I live for is make him happy. You know, John, Johnny's my musician. I'm a drummer, but the, the, he's the most important musician in my life. You know, when I heard that, because that music connected with me more than just, oh, that's impressive or that's groovy or funky. It was There was something else. And I've talked to many musicians. They all feel the same. So many musicians feel the same way about that band. And it, and it, it, it was, it opened me up to a spiritual thing in life. It opened me up to thinking about that sort of thing and how the, how music related to that. You know, I, I, I think that the, the reason why it was, it was so successful is because um, John was on a mission and he actually achieved it. He was able to talk to a lot of people through that band. And I think uh, once that was done, it was done mm -hmm. in a strange way. And then he went and did Shakti and that was another thing. But I think mm -hmm. um, that, that must have been a very intense time for him and for everybody involved, you know, to, to be a part of that because you you were playing to big audiences and those audiences were really moved by what is very difficult music, very extreme music. Um, incred incredible time, incredible time. I, I, I really think it's the, the peak of what rock music was about, really. Mm -hmm. not, not just Mavish New, but especially Mavish. <laughs> other bands okay. as well, other bands as well, you know. Um, um, can you tell me a little bit, a bit about Jan Hammer? Because you you played a lot with Jan, didn't you? you we, did you play with him in the Tommy Bowling Band? Is that right? No, 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 no. No, quite frankly, Jan scared me because uh, we were in rehearsal with Mavish Orchestra and at SAR in New York. And I'm a fan of Jan Hammer, although I never really met him. I'd seen him play a few times with Mavish Orchestra and how genius he is. And when he walked in the rehearsal room, it's, um, for me, it was a life, life defining moment. Like whoever I am, whatever I got, I better bring it because there's a damn yawn armor looking at you. And Vishnu and I just were just doing something and we just had a good time playing. And it wasn't long after that, Jan asked if he came on a few of the shows we played just to kind of jam. And to actually hear him jam was like incredible. He'd be in Boston or wherever it was on the East Coast, he'd come and jam. But I never really, never really still hung out with him or anything, anything like that. On the, on the Tommy Bowen album, me at Marching Powder, that's my first time playing live with him. Yeah. That. And to actually watch him in a room, because that was everyone in the room playing. <laughs> and I was just taken by him again. His timing is, is just flawless. And then, of course, you mentioned Wired. Those pieces, Lead Boots, Come Dancing, Play With Me, Sophie. He's overdubbing. He was not there. He overdubs to the to the T every little thing that I might play over someone plays so perfectly. You think we're all in the same room, but it's not. I He's can't believe that. Like, because you and him on those tracks, there's a magic going on between the way you play, the way you feel time, and the way Jan Hammer feels time. Uh, that did so much. I can't believe that he's overdubbing that. And I didn't hear it till the record came out. It was mixed at his place, coming out. I buy a copy and I hear what he's playing. I'm like, damn, this guy's phenomenal. I, I, he, I think he, he's underrated. I think that it, as a keyboardist, he's one of the greatest. And you know, he's jazz keyboard playing, Hammond organ, and then it, the Moog, which he invented. But he's one of my favorite drummers. I can hear yeah. Tony Williams so much. He's, you know, you say no one can play like Tony. Jan can, he's not far from Tony. You can hear it. It's, it's incredible playing. And, and, uh, and then his production as well. He's the way he mixes stuff. Absolutely, mm -hmm. incre absolutely he mixed, incredible. He mixed, he mixed, he mixed that Led Boot album, the Wired album. Yeah. 
George Martin, those guys mixed it, but guess what? It wasn't until Jeff went, went over to Jan's place and fell in love with the sound that came out of Jan's studio that Jan mixed it. So he's, he, he, he knows how to use a compressor. You do too. <laughs> But he really does, you know, the, 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 I think it's the sound of the drums he gets, you know, when, when Jan's playing the drums, it's incredible, really, really incredible. So um, you're like right in the middle of all this fusion stuff, all this stuff's happening. You, you then start making pop records that have hits. How, how does that happen? How did you transfer over to that? And it's very interesting because Jan in the 80s almost does the same thing as well. <laughs> he, you know, Jan Hammer suddenly starts having hit records. You know, it's that, it's, it, to me, it's that Ma Vishnu spirit <laughs> going out into the world, you know. But yeah, I mean, how, how did that happen? <clears throat> uh, it's in my world. Uh, I got married in 1978. I moved to San Francisco and uh, I was working on my third album for, for Atlantic, Atlantic Studios. I'd already done Garden Love Light, Did I Cry a Smile. And for the third album, I was about halfway through cutting it. And they said, if you don't have a hit on this next album, we're gonna drop you. And that to me was like someone saying you have cancer. I did not want to be dropped. I did not want to be without a label in my life. And without the exposure a label can bring and Atlantic Records is hot with Ahmed Erdogan and my friends. So, and they suggested, they said, well, you know, you don't understand. Right now the whole world shifted. People are dancing and disco's hot. And uh, I knew about it because I listen to all, all top music. And they said, you may want to come to New York and check out what's going on over here because it's like a, a revolution. And they were right. I went to New York, man, and people were dancing like crazy and that beat and that, and that, and that funk and then the, the clubs beating and carrying on and the four on the floor, powerful, <clears throat> like it is now. Mm. But back then it was the beginning of it, the beginning of it. And so I got some inspiration from Rick James, a song called You and I. And I was in the Hilton Hotel. I wrote four songs, side one of Awakening. And uh, I wrote a song, I Don't Want to Buzz Dance With You, and the other songs that came in that little hotel room. And then Bobby Clearmountain at Power Station. I was still looking to work with him. I went over there and cut it with Hiram Bullock on guitar, Cliff Card on keyboards, Norma Slowly on bass. <clears throat> and got lucky to get the Brecker brothers, Randy Brecker and, and Michael Brecker and David Sanborn, do horns. So <clears throat> I felt like I was bringing music into disco, which I felt good about, mm. and dance and funk. And I was very proud to make it because it was funky. And God blessed me to have a hit. So I did not get dropped. I did not want to get dropped. And, and they you, celebrated me in Atlanta. You, you have beautiful changes. You know, I think when, when I got Garden of Love Light, I could hear these incredible harmony and chord changes. And then when you start to make the more commercial accessible music, I could still hear the same changes. So did you study that as well? Obviously, you know that stuff, you, all the chords and scales and stuff. I know, I, I never studied uh, keyboard. It's just by ear, I play by ear. Really? I play by ear and just like listen to my soul. And I'm very inspired by a lot of music as I, as I told you earlier. Yeah. And also like Laura Nero, a big part of my soul. I study her music a lot. Laura Nero, for some reason, really touched me. And because she could be so dra dra dramatic, slow, stop, scream, you know, and just beautiful changes. Like on a song like Emily on, Elon, 13 Confessions, she's just so deep. And then the next album is New York Tenderberry with You Don't Love Me When I Cry and The Man Who Sends Me Home. She's so sensitive and deep, it just touched my soul. So I love her for that. I love Joni Mitchell too. Love James Taylor, love all that stuff. Love Stevie. You know, just love songs, love songs. But as a piano player, I just love just playing the keyboard, just, just, just find the right sound. And Vishnu was so kind, he gave me his, his roads. You know, I, had, I lived in the basement in Queens when I was with, with Mavish Orchestra. He gave me his friend of Rose that he worked on to write Apocalypse, to write those albums. Mm. And on that Rhodes, I wrote Cosmic Strut, Way the, Way the Pilgrim, you know, a lot of that music. So he's very, very always kind to me. I gotta say that again. Mavish knew, John McLaughlin, um, without him, I would, I would not be here. He really took me under his wing and, and taught me to listen more. And, you know, gave, gave me such a wonderful opportunity. I just want to say that about him. Well, I mean, 
I think so many people, I think it's, it's such a, a huge force of power for music, for so many musicians. It's, it's, it's like the source of something. Where he got it from is a mystery. <laughs> but well, yeah. he's, a, he's a God lover in that he loves the, cre the creation of the universe. Like, you know, I asked him on my, on my podcast, well, what keeps you so inspired even now? You know, the universe. And he's right, man, because you know what? I remember being on planes with him, traveling from one place to another, and he'd be reading books on black holes in the universe, trying to explain to me that what, a, what, a, what a black hole is. Always intrigued with the universe. And how it goes on, 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 there's no end to it. And when I heard him play like Miles out in the studio, I felt it again. Like Hendrix, he loved everything he loved coming through, just like in sheets and sheets and sheets and sound. I, I, he, has, yeah. he, has, he has the capacity when he wants to, yep. to go out as far as he wants to go in this universe. Cleanly and clearly, descriptively. <laughs> you, you, you've said something and I'm, I've never really thought it, but that, that wonder of the universe and it, it cannot go on forever and it cannot end. It's, it's, we actually can't understand it. And, and you, we ignore that. But then sometimes you're faced with that as an idea. That's what I heard in Mavish New Music. That's what I could hear in it. That thing, when I, when I put Birds of Fire on for the first time, my mom got me this. <laughs> my mom saw it. You know, I'd, I'd been talking about it to my mom and my mom was like, I found this album, uh, Andrew, I found this album and she brought it in and I put it on. It just was there when I came home from school and I put it on and I stared at the speakers in disbelief because it was the infinite. Mm -hmm. It is, isn't it? And he, he's, yeah. he was able to capture that in music. Yeah. It's but an he, but he, thing. He made it a conscious effort. You know, he, he, he lives his life like that. He prayed, he meditated, he'd do anything he took to just be in touch with his soul, in touch with the highest and ask that highest to come on through. And it, it did, man, it does. And I've learned that trick, you know, I don't care who I'm producing, if it's Whitney Houston, I want to dance with who loves me. The most commercial thing in the world. That's my vision in there. Cause I'm praying, let, let the high spirit come on through. Everything I do, I don't care how pop it is, how commercial it is, it's my vision. What was it like when you were asked to work with Aretha Franklin? Because she's, to me, that's the greatest pop singer that's ever lived. <laughs> oh, I've got a production job for you, Nada. It's the greatest pop singer that's ever lived. What, what was that like? I had to give props to Clive Davis because he was the one uh, that, um, he was first taken by my work with a, a girl named Stacey Ladizal. And he said, well, how'd you learn how to produce that kind of music? I said, well, I just love all music. He said, well, you must. And he said, how do you, how would you feel about working with some of the artists for Arista, like Dionne Warwick? I said, Dionne Warwick is my, is my, and Burt Backrack and Hal David, those people are my heroes. I, I learned how to do that stuff because of them, pop wise. And I went and met with Dionne, but Dionne at that time wasn't really feeling it. He said, well, how about Aretha Franklin? Just like that. He said, just give her a call. He said, just give her a call. Just that easy. And I did. I got the telephone and I called Aretha Franklin. And I would say, well, Aretha, what do you do for fun? And she would say, oh, maybe I go out to a nightclub, you know? Maybe I see someone in the corner. He's looking at me, I'm looking at him, you know? And he thinks he's got me, but then the fish jumps off the hook. <laughs> he laugh like that. And I'm writing all that down. She says, it's like, who's zooming who kind of feeling? So I'm writing out who's zooming who, I'm writing this whole thing down. And then I got my friend Preston Glass, the great composer with me, and and we just put life to her ideas. That's how that came about. Cause I really wanted to have um, a successful album for, for Aretha and bring her the sound of the day. What that means is right behind me, Prince on the wall up there. Yeah. The sound that he was making with Purple Rain with the machinery, not necessarily live stuff was listening to guitar, but the drums were machines programmed to the T all the soul he can get out of a machine. So I went there. I want to suck every bit of soul out of a machine I could, I could do and learn how to, you know, record them fast and slow the tape down. So they go, all kind of tricks to make the thing sound like what I want in pop music.
and then make Aretha, all the natural soul on top, deliver it. And that's what we were able to try to do with Who's Zoom and Who, the Freeway of Love, where I did add live drums to that because I wanted Motown feeling yeah. up. But a lot of what I got into for Aretha was a mixture of bringing the current sound that I was hearing from Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson's, the off the wall, all that sound into Prince and everything I was hearing from that time with Aretha. So it'd be a current new sound for her. So I really was praying on that. Here's one of my silly questions. Did Aretha know that you were one of the greatest drummers of all time when you were working with her? No, no, she told me uh, <laughs> we did the Freeway of Love, uh, Freeway of Love video. She said, you know, I saw you playing the drums, having fun. She said, but it wasn't until I got with her before she died. The last seven shows of her life, she said, she said I did not know you could play like that. <laughs> she asked me to come out and play the last time, and I did. And I'm so glad I did, but she said, I had no idea you could play like that. Uh, and then, and we we, we make Free Red Love like 15 minutes long, just jamming. She'd leave the stage, come back on the stage, leave the stage, come back on the stage. We're still just rocking, man. Yeah. Because she was into Art Tatum, wasn't she? When she, she grew up, she, she was in everybody. She was in the John Coltrane. Yeah, she's and she, she's in love she, with John Coltrane. Serious keyboardist, wasn't she? Oh, she's very, 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 very serious and very sensitive. Could play every little thing on piano, which I didn't know how that that she was that genius on piano until we started playing live. Well, I heard a story that when she was very young and she first went to the studio, she was surrounded by all these guys that were much older than her, and she couldn't get a say. So she just walks over to the keyboard, this the keyboard piano hits one chord and these chords are the chord of all chords and they just stopped who's played that chord and they saw her you know teenager just hit that chord and then they shut up and started listening yeah she, she was something I, I i she's one singer that however good i think she is if i put a record on by her she's always better than i can think <laughs> i imagine oh. she, she was incredible yes that's the i remember on the on the one of the songs i was trying to make it to smash by making sure the first verse wasn't too solely where, the, where we couldn't establish the melody enough for everyday people. Cause she just sings so much stuff, you know, she hears so much stuff. So I would say to her, well, maybe let's make one more take of that first verse. And she will say, well, what's wrong with it? I said, well, nothing's wrong with it. It's, it's genius, but I want to maybe have one more take. She said, all right, I'll be good to you. I'll give you what's called a straight reading. I said, what's a straight reading? It's a straight reading. I sing it again for you. And I do it a little close to the melody. I said, okay, gives us another take. So she goes back in and she sings it again, a little bit more of the melody. It's cool. But when I come back home to Tarpan, where I'm at right now, Tarpan, to put it all together, to comp everything together, inevitably I go back to the take that I thought was maybe a little too much. That's the damn record. Because she got so much, so much feeling into it. You can't, you can't ignore it. It's so much, so much in there. So I, I just I can't love even imagine it. how you would produce Aretha Franklin because. I've done a little bit of production and often you're trying to get a performance out of singers and they're not confident. You're trying to make them feel comfortable. But do you have to do that for Aretha or did she just come in and no. she's ready to go? Yeah. Remember how you said that uh, it's about love? You love, you love everybody and especially Aretha Franklin because as great as she is, the champion that she is, you still have to, not still, you, you want to and you do. You look in the fire in her eyes and you're just, you're taken aback by who you're looking into. But then it's, it's a magic that happens. Once the music comes on, the groove, the sound, the music, then we're, we, we, we bond as friends to make the music the best it can be. And that happened right away. Then we became the best of friends. And she's like, well, what do you want to eat? You want, a, you want a cheeseburger? You want, you, want, you want some fried chicken? What you want, you know? <laughs> then it was on, man. Then I got my mind blown because I want to. I go out to the music stand, maybe make a little change of a lyric. There's no paper there; it's all memorized, every bit of it, every little thing that she thought she might want to do, you know, is memorized. That's when I realized at a different level, just a whole other level. Well, what about working with Whitney? Because obviously, this is a you had one singer that was already a great singer, then you you go to a singer that's really just starting, but an incredible. Yes, Incredible. I knew about Whitney only because Sissy Houston sang on Garden Love Light. As Sissy Houston, her singers on Garden Love Light, taking me to the Garden Love Light. I never... with, with Tommy Dowd, see what I mean? And then in the corner was a little 11 year old girl who was beautiful. And that was little Whitney. Well, I didn't know that'd be Whitney Houston. But later on, I'm making the album for Aretha and Jerry Griffith calls and says, you gotta make time to do a song for, for Whitney Houston. And I said, I don't have time now because this is my total focus, this Aretha album. I said, no, I'll make time. 
you make time. This is, this is Sissy's daughter. And they had an idea of a song, How Will I Know? They sent me the chorus. It didn't have any verses to it. So it was, let me bang on some verse. And I was able to do that and then, and cut it on the same session as the Freeway of Love sessions with Randy Jackson on bass, Carlo Rucci on guitar, Frank Martin, Walter Fiasanavia, Preston Glass, my little team, and just barrel it down. And I cut it high because I wanted to be a showcase. I called a witness, can you sing high? He said, yeah, I can sing high. I said, I'm gonna cut this really high. There's a boy, I know, he's the one I dream of. He said, yeah, I can do that. I said, okay. Then I flew to New York. And when she come in the studio, she looks beautiful. Like Whitney Houston, just flawless. Beautiful cheekbones and everything beautiful. And she goes to sing it. And that voice you hear on How Will I Know is just like that. She's just got it down, just down. I said, well, let's double this part. Let's harmonize that part. Come and listen to it. She come and listen to it. She look at me when it's playing down, like you, uh, you, you, you're me. She look at me like this. You, can you hear how beautiful that sounds? <laughs> yeah, you, you checking it out, right? You checking it out, right? <laughs> like, that, like that, very confident. So I was like, damn, man. Now I see why that why Jerry made sure I produce her because she's going to be a major, major, major force. And then I said, can you get your mother to come sing background? She said, sure. She calls Sissy, ding, 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 ding. Down comes Sissy with her singers. And they're out there singing it. And it's a good sound. But I say, Whitney, go out there and join your mother. And she does. And then that's the sound you hear on How I Know. Her mother and her together. That's the power. Lord of mercy. And then that becomes a big hit for her on the third single on the first album. And then Clive Davis is very kind to me. He says, meet me at this hotel in, in Beverly Hills, Beverly Hilton, the Bel Air, the Bel Air. I go there. He plays me the demo. Uh, I want to dance when he loves me. Uh, things he's picked out, like where broken hearts go. I think one or two others, not so emotional. You hadn't found so emotional yet. But when I heard the demo, I'm trying to think how I can make these demos come to life. That's my thing. How I can make them be strong in the, in the black ghetto where the people live. You know, because if I can get the, get the people live, then we can get everybody. But you got to get the people. So that was my thing, how to get Randy Jackson, make him sound nasty on the bass and make, make that, that outhouse bottom, that nasty bottom, and then make the, the beautiful top. So working with Whitney Houston has always been a real dream come true because she was so great. But I realized she was tired because they, they worked her so hard. She'd be tired. I only have like two hours, three hours at most per song. So I would say, just, just do this first verse, you know, do the second verse, go to the ending, blow it out, blow out some ideas in the ending while you got energy. And then do first chord, second chord, just, just a little, and go home. And I save all night long, put them all together. When she come back the next day, I said, sit down. I hit play. Boom, on come the sound. She says, damn, it's a damn hit. I said, yeah, it's a hit. All you got to do is add a little thing here, a little thing there, we're done. That's how we fell in love with each other. That I could not, you know, take too long with her to get a good result. Then we just did like lots and lots and lots of songs together. It's incredible. You've had an incredible life now. Incredible thank life, thank you, but thank you, you work with the best. And just it, 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 it's difficult to say much. What, what are you doing at the moment? What's what's I'm very happy to be here in my beautiful studio. I want to invite you to my studio, Andy. You know, come over and play. Oh, play I'd love, to, I'd love to, be to be there, yeah. And um, I'm just taking a moment just to breathe. And um, I'm writing a new album for myself, I want to write new, new music for myself right now, yeah. That's incredible. Well. All I can say now is I, I heard you when I was probably 13, 14 years old. Uh, and that there's loads of drummers. I love loads of different drummers, but your drumming and your music and the journey it took me on. This is the thing is that it took me on a journey. I started searching and I was and I, and I went and I, you know, it took me on a journey. I went around the world. I played with Robert Plants. I played with different bands. I've done all these sort of, sorts of things, and I'm 54 now. And for some reason, I've gone right back to the thing when I was 14 years old. I'm back on YouTube and I'm talking about the music I love, and and that's sending a message out again. And when I heard that you were saying, "Who's this Andy Edwards? Where is he? Where is he?" I, I could not believe it because it's it's an echo of something that has that started for me 40 years ago. And for you started even nearly 50 years ago. This is an incredible thing. I, I don't understand it. And the fact that I'm talking to you now 
is it just shows that life is a mystery and an incredible thing and we're on a journey and I just that's all I can say it's an incredible thing to have spoken to you and and to be able to share this with you it really is and I can't tell you how much I owe you how much I love you how much I love the music that's all I can say that's I, I really genuinely want to say that it's absolutely incredible to have been I'll get upset if I carry on I'm going to get upset <laughs> okay, okay. well I want to say thank you to you um, you renewed my spirit with your love and your um, and your and your love of the spirit. Your love of the spirit has really touched my spirit. And I think back on my life, all the things I love, you know, like I want to share one thing with you. There was a, an album. I was with my dad on a Saturday afternoon and he's go to his friend's house to have beer. After we do our little custodian jobs, clean up the place, we go downstairs. And he'd drink his beer with his friend Marvin and Calvin Gant. And they'd be playing down there this, this song called The Sermon by Jimmy Smith. It'd be Art Blakey on drums, but it'd be like a backbeat for like 22 minutes long. It wasn't like jazz jazz, it'd be like blues. Just like that, rocking all the way. And I was really, as a kid, like, this is badass because it's jazz. All these cats are blowing all the jazz that they can play, but he's playing a simple backbeat. That was E equals E equals MC squared to me, the power of a backbeat. So no matter who I got with my vision, whatever, I've always loved backbeat. And in fact, I learned being in the little ghetto chitlin circuit, all these great bands that come on, you wouldn't even know who they are. They would, they would kill with a backbeat. That backbeat would be so powerful in those little clubs, the way they play it, the way they felt it. It just, I, I learned again, man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get, reach the people. That back be so powerful. I same, think that's same with me. I, I, I could never be a jazz drummer. I could never be a rock drummer. I could never be a funk drummer. I wanted it all. Yeah, right. And I, and I could hear it in everything. I could hear it right across. Yeah. You know, yeah. John Bonham. You know, yeah. John Bonham for the first time. You know, he had it, you know. And, and you know, when I was when I was playing with Robert Plant, he, he Robert used to say, Andy, do you like Alphonse Mouzon? And I go, oh, yeah, I love him. I love him with McCoy Tyner and I love his pop records. I love him. And he and he go, John loved Alphonse Mouzon. Okay. It's the same okay. thing. It's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah. And he also loved Lenny White. Oh, well, Lenny, when I talked to him. He said, John Bonham gave him a great compliment. And I like John Bonham a lot, too. I love John Bonham because he has so much passion, man. You know, he, I saw him recently doing this triplet fill really fast, you know. He'd get into the, he'd get into the speed, because he had it. Mm. Well, he was dirt funky, bro. And he knew how to like just drag it when he wanted to. He dragged time. Like, here's time, here's ahead of time, here's on time, here's behind time. Bonham could, could play tricks with time. He just, just, just drag it on ya. He's mean. No, Palmer. On purpose. Earl Palmer, that's the guy <laughs> that he was listening to, Earl Palmer. And then when I heard Earl Palmer, Eddie Cochran, something else, and that two-handed groove and the backbeat, God, I, when I heard that, mm -hmm. it just goes back, all goes back to the source. Mm -hmm. And we don't and know what. Me, and for us in America, what turned us around was James Brown, all the James Brown stuff, but in particular, Cold Sweat. Yeah. Boom. Scott, a booga boom. Scott, a boom. Scott, Scott, the booga got boom, boom. Scott, a booga boom. Scott, a boom. Scott, that the booga got boom, boom. The, the cold sweat. You had to do cold sweat. If you took cold, <laughs> if you took cold sweat out of my drumming, there's hardly anything left. <laughs> if somebody says play something good on the drums, Andy, a boom, a catch, a chicka, a boom, a chicka, a chicka, a Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. But yeah. to me, it was all the same, all the same thing, all the same. Yeah. And it all goes back to the source. That's right. Like this guy, uh, Antonio Sanchez. I love his work. He's so brilliant with all the fast, flashy things he can do. But he understands Elvin Jones. He understands the funk. That's why I'm, I, that's why I'm a fan, see? I'm a fan of anybody who can understand just the, the little ghetto nightclub. The little ghetto nightclub, you got that in you, you you're bad to me. Yeah. It's been fantastic talking to you. And I know if I don't stop, I'll be going all night. Thank you, Andy. I want to thank you again, man. 
you you rekindled in me a lot of love. I'm just so happy that I, I met you, and I like you to come over to our studios and and. I will. I will do all this. I love you too, Nada, and I'm gonna let's keep in touch and keep talking, and I'm gonna stop the recording right now. Okay. Right. If I stopped it. <laughs>